Apologies for the delay. Uh, when I posted the last three entries, my grandpa was elated. We spent too much time going over the comments, and it brought him joy that I haven't seen in a long time. His health took a brief turn for the worst in the recent weeks, and um, he made me promise to not post any more transcriptions of our conversations without him being able to sit down with me and watch the comments roll in. So, I kept that promise. Luckily, he's back to where he was when we started this whole thing, which... Which still isn't great, but it's better than he has been recently. So I'm proud to present the fourth impossible case. It's not always people, you know. The, uh, the impossible ones weren't limited to just people. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, maybe we, we caught a call. A uh, suspected murder had taken place. Mail had filled up the mailbox. Eventually, someone called the police for a wellness check. Well, some uniforms go to check. They look through the window, and they see... Uh, they see blood on the living room carpet and the walls. They go in, clear the house. We get called. I remember the phone call. Um, the same as the calls from the impossible cases. Yeah, we uh, we know it's it's another one, but we get so. You can always tell how crappy our day was going to be by the tone of voice of whoever called us. It was me and a temporary partner I had. This guy, uh, Malloy. He'd come over from across the state. But like every detective, he was, he was familiar with the impossible ones. Though he said that at his last shop, they were referred to as the unexplained. Different name, same mind-boggling bullshit. Anyway, uh, well, as we pull up at the house, and we find everyone standing outside. Get outside of the car, thinking they're just trying to preserve the scene. And then we see everyone is, is really on edge. Jumping when we shut the doors, staring at the ground, you know, just... Acting real antsy. We ask him what's going on. No one says a word. Go around asking if the house has been cleared. Finally, uniformed. Um, looks like his first day on the job. Nods his head a bit. Moy and I go into the house, you know. Uh, looks normal. Just a normal suburban house. There's a stain on the living room carpet. It's very clearly blood. It made it all the more obvious by the fact there was a blood dripping from the ceiling. You, know, you ever see a ceiling with with uh, flood damage. It looks like dropping a feather on it from some other side is going to make it come crashing down. That's that's how the spot above the stain was. It was dark and it was red. It looked thin as wet tissue. Obviously, I think there must have been a, a body upstairs. And based on the call we got and how the folks outside were acting, we were expecting something real, um, you know, uh, something real gruesome. We go upstairs, figure out which room the stain is below. And then when we um, when we walk in, there's nothing. Room's normal. About two seconds after we open the door, and that's when we first hear it. Tap, 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 tap. The best way I can describe it, it's like they're, they're tapping their pinky, and half a second later, their ring finger, and their middle finger, Index, thumb, boom, 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 real fast. You know, Malo and I, we both spin around. It's not like someone was tapping on the wall in the room across the hall from one of the ones we were in. And now the door to that room is closed. So we've been informed that this woman, she lived by herself, didn't have any kids, no husband, and not even any family that lived in the state, so there shouldn't be anyone else there. And Malo and I draw our weapons. Start doing the whole open the door, show us your hands, yada, yada, you know, that thing. No one responds. We... We stand there long enough with our weapons pointed at the wall. And I, I was pointing at the door. Malloy, Malloy had his train on the wall. We stand there long enough. I don't hear anything back. I start to wonder if we heard something. The others, like from maybe outside or something. And the um, unis had cleared the house. Never done us wrong before, but with how weird they were acting, we, we wanted to be sure. Just as I start to take a step to pass Malloy and move towards the other room, we hear it again. Tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Only well, this time it sounds like it's from the room on the other side of the wall from the one we're in. You know, the, on the, the same side of the hall, just, just the door down. I yell out, police, step out in the hallway with your hands up. And again, no response. Tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. This one comes from the opposite wall from the previous one, which would put... 
whoever was doing it on the stairs leading upstairs. Malloy was still standing in the doorway, so he took a step and leaned over to take a look. He looked over at me and he shook his head. There wasn't anyone there. Next set of taps, same pattern, come from above us, like in the attic. Then higher up on the wall by the stairs, then down the hall, then from underneath my feet, like someone was tapping on the ceiling in the living room, then back on the wall in the opposite room, over and over and over and over and over. It sounded like a miniature stampede was happening all around us. It lasted about 30 seconds, then as quickly as it started, it just stopped. And Malloy and I, we stayed there for a good 10 minutes, guns up, arms aching, wondering what the hell was going on. We both finally calmed down enough to act rationally. We went through and we cleared the house again. Attic, top floor, ground floor, basement. We did it ourselves just to make sure that it, it got done thoroughly and there was no one. House was empty. Except for us. Then we have to deal with the fact that the ceiling and living room is leaking blood, but there doesn't seem to be a source. Bathroom where the leak should have been, where the body should have been. There's a throw rug in there. You know, over like, uh, over the hardwood floor. So you move the rug. There's this uh, little little uh, door type thing, I guess you'd call it. A little door on the floor. It's the size of a pack of cigarettes. It's a hinge. It's flush with the floor. I open it. I shine a flashlight in. There's nothing in there. There's no source of where the blood could be coming from. Even after we had some guy come in and take out the floorboards, I took out the insulation. It was dry. Material they made up the ceiling while it was soaked with blood on the bottom of it. It was completely dry on top. Which, I mean, it's, it, it's impossible. It's like the source of the blood was in between a half-inch, inch-thick piece of plaster. That was a hell of a long day, I'll tell you. So it's late now. It's probably like 2, 2.30 in the morning. And Malloy and I were still in the house looking around. We finally got a few people to come in, you know, fingerprint folks, photographers. They get their job done. And um, me and Malloy are standing in the kitchen. He goes, do you hear that? I did hear a thing. He goes, there it is again. And I hadn't heard a thing. He goes, he goes there it is again. I'm straining my ears right to hear what he's hearing. So I turn to look at him and I ask what he's, what he's hearing. I won't lie to you, my heart skipped a beat. So Malloy, Malloy was standing. So he was standing there, he was staring staring straight ahead into my eyes, but it was like he was looking through me. His face had gone completely limp, slack. And, and his eyes, his eyes looked like they were, they'd been turned off, like there was no life behind him. His mouth hung open like he was just, like he was just totally brain dead. Loy, I said. He stared through me. The point that I looked over my shoulder to make sure no one was behind me. When I turned back, Malloy was pointing to the basement door. I looked over, saw that it was closed. When I looked back again, Malloy was was pointing, but the life had returned to his face. He looked normal. I asked Malloy, what the hell happened? He just said, you didn't hear that? I told him I had, and he said he, he needed to check the basement again. So we head over, we open the door. Only now the lights wouldn't turn on. And they worked fine the entire day, but all of a sudden now, nothing. We got our flashlights out, we head down. I asked him why we were checking the basement again. He just kept saying, we need to check the basement again. You didn't hear that? So we get down there and everything looks the same as it had. Same as it had all day. Tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Sounds, tapping sound. Like they were, they were against one of the metal racks that lined the basement walls. We shine our light. All around. There's nothing. No one. Tap, 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 tap. This time it sounds like it's on the cardboard box. You didn't hear that? Malloy says again. Tapping starts all around us, on the metal, it's on the cardboard, it's on the plastic, the wall, drywall, the wood, the plaster. It gets to the, the point that it's deafening. I shine my light all around. It eventually lands on Malloy, who at some point moved to the corner. He had the same dead look on his face again, and he was, he was pointing towards the ceiling just behind me. Now, I consider myself a brave man, right? In the, but, but in that moment, in that moment, I... I was about as scared as I could have been. See, I, I didn't want to look behind me. It felt like something was there, looking at me, waiting, waiting for me to turn around. You didn't hear that? Malay says again. You didn't hear that? You didn't hear that? 
You didn't hear that? You didn't hear that? He just kept repeating it over and over and over. And he started slurring his words like he'd been... Like he'd sound if he'd, if he'd been drunk. Now I'm yelling at him to shut his mouth, scared out of my mind. And, and so there's already been a lot of this that, that it makes you scratch your head, you know, and you say, what the hell? And then, and then I can, you know, I work up the courage enough to turn around and the, you know, the Malloy was still repeating that over and over, but I turn around and I look up towards where he was pointing. And there's this spot in the plaster in the, the basement ceiling that was newer than the rest of it. Same size, the little door on the floor of the second level. We've been through the house more times than I can remember. Neither of us had noticed that door till now, which seemed, uh, seemed unlikely. The, ta the tapping seems to be getting louder, faster. So I got Malloy yelling over and over. I'm, I'm so afraid. I think I might piss myself. I'm so afraid. I, it gets so loud, I cover my ears and start hunching over. I mean, it sounds like you could have, you could have heard it on the other side of the neighborhood. Then it stopped again. Look over to Malloy. I saw him sobbing into his hands. He walked up the basement stairs without saying a word. I, I, I wanted to get the hell out of there, but at the same time, I didn't want to skimp on my duties. So I, I yelled up the stairs for a few of the construction guys to come down and take take down that piece of, of plaster that the spot was on. Then screw the screws when the one side of the piece is lower than the others. It's lower than the others. A little bag slides out, falls to the floor. The bag has fingers in it. Three fingers. I remember, I remember right, they were um, an index, a ring, and a pinky finger. We eventually went back upstairs, and when we did, and there were spots like the ones in the basement all over the place. The ceiling in the living room had, had stopped bleeding, but when we, we had more of these spots, must have, been, must have been five or six on each level of the house. Inside each was bags of fingers, former pinky to thumb. We had them all tested, and far we could tell at least some of them belonged to previous owners of the house, going back decades. Turns out everyone who lived in that house had died. One, one of them was by suicide, the rest were natural causes. But it was odd. All the fingers were in perfect condition, like they'd just been, just been removed from the body. Decomp hadn't even started yet. Doesn't make goddamn sense. Lloyd, that poor bastard, he quit the job the following day, refused to talk about what he... He had going on in his head during all that time. He tried to commit suicide twice, I know of. Now he lives with his daughter in Monterey, California. A few years after that day, I tried, I tried to check in on him from time to time, and he, he would apparently have these fits where he just screams. You didn't hear that? You didn't hear that? Over and over. Um, I was supposed to go back to the house a few, a few days later. I showed up, and when I got to the front door, I just couldn't do it. You know, the, the fear set in again. I made feel like I was going to pass out. I knew right from the jump this this one didn't have an answer. I still I still did my due diligence. I did what I could what I could to find some answers, but I refused to go back to that house. Uh, and and the woman the woman who lived there the do the neighbor down the street had seen her walk in the morning that we got the call. It was several days after she'd stopped getting her mail for whatever reason, even though she was apparently home. She walked down the street and onto the main road, and we tracked her security tapes, but she turned the corner from North Avenue to um, 92nd Street. It just vanished. Poof. In the thin air. I wondered for a long time what happened to her. Then one day, after seven years later, we, we get a tape in the mail. We've been sent to the precinct. Addresses of uh, both me and Malloy. It was a security tape from a gas station. Timestamp was a day after we'd been to her house, so the day that she'd vanished about two hours ago. And after the, across the street from the gas station, some folks were doing some tree work. A woman walked up the area. These folks were doing the work. She set her purse down, her ID on top of it. She leaned forward, and she just she she just goes head first into the wood chipper. 
Yeah. It messed up, right? Yeah. Even, um... Even more messed up than that, the tape came from a gas station in Florida. It's about 1,200 miles. Never, fit, never did figure out how she got from the corner of 92nd and north to Tampa Bay, Florida in under two hours. You know, I should probably tell you about the, the very first impossible case I ever had. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we are back after Halloween. So, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreons. Those uh, specifically are the ones that are in the description. And Joey Gilbert, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Chompinski, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Buddy Burroughs, Stephen Van House, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Asia, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Kao, Caleb Dougal, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Alex, Steampunk Sinner, The Rafael Rodriguez, Optimistic Avocado, and Dr. Strawberry. If you guys would like to join them, you can always head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Even helping with $1 actually helps keep me alive. So a big thank you to all of you who are there from $1 all the way up to however much that you guys give. Thank you. I appreciate you guys subscribing and checking back with the channel every single day because, dear Lord help me, we are on daily uploads, meaning new horror stories from me here at Mr. Creepypasta on YouTube or Mr. Creepypasta on Spotify. Sweet dreams, kids.